Welcome to State of the State. I'm John Calavalli hosting this program with Pat Cordelessa. Pat Cordelessa is a candidate for Secretary of State. Uh, Pat, you ran in 2018 against incumbent Nellie Gorbea. And this time, 2022, you will not be competing with an incumbent. Sounds like a good idea to me. Well, John, first, thank you for having me come on your show um, and give me the opportunity to tell the voters there, the electorate, what my plans are if I am elected by the general public. And yes, uh, the 2018 uh, campaign for Secretary of State was very interesting. I thought we brought out some great opportunities for the voters to understand the difference of how to run the Secretary of State's office, which is the controlling factor of the Board of Elections and election laws in Rhode Island. So with that said, taking that knowledge and um, you know, experience into this campaign is um, very, in my case, very good because um, you know, we've been down the road once, uh, the second time it's a lot easier and you can focus on more important issues and, and fine tune the, the issues in, in, uh, in general speak, basically. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right about that, Pat. Uh, Pat, do you want to tell our viewers a little bit about yourself personally and professionally? Just kind of give them a brief introduction to who Pat Cordelesser is. You know, Pat Cordelesser was born and raised in Providence, Rhode Island, down in the West End off uh, Cranston Street. Um, when I was a small child, uh, you know, going down to the Federal Hill Little League, playing in that, that uh, league and by the Cranston Armory. Uh, attending all the uh, local schools in Providence, uh, Willow Street, Ace Mesa, Bridgham, and Central High School. And I, have a, I think it gave me a great in, 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 insight on the people's struggles in, uh, in the inner city of Providence and, uh, and also then growing up, uh, you know, uh, going into other neighborhoods in Cranston where I finally uh, spent the last 30 years. But my roots never really left Providence. I have many, many friends there, and I still go into the city quite often. Um, I was in the real estate business at one time, commercial properties in downtown, which I sold uh, s some of the properties out several years ago. And um, I started out in the nightclub restaurant business when I was in the early 20s. And um, ultimately, um, got out of that type of nightclub business, uh, and then just uh, basically raised a family and love, love Rhode Island and stayed here while everyone else seems to be trying to you know, leave due to the economic issues. So with family here and uh, raising children, uh, you know, I'm here to uh, now deal with my, uh, my likes, basically politics I took in college uh, and um, political science uh, candidate uh, uh, classes. Uh, did some ROTC classes in PC. I uh, was going to go in the military, but decided to go into uh, the restaurant nightclub business when I was in the early 20s. So, you know, here we are now, um, enjoying Rhode Island in my uh, mid-60s, and I want to give back, and hopefully uh, through the Secretary of State's office, just make um, everyone feel confident and secure that the, uh, the election laws are fair and equitable for everybody, and everybody has a fair chance of voting, but as President Reagan once said, um, trust but verify. And that's what I want to bring, which unfortunately there is none right now you in, know, in the Pat, elections. That is very good <laughs> advice, <laughs> especially uh, uh, in this day and age when so much is going on politically uh, that we're being divided as a, a, a nation of people and it's uh, unfortunate that we're heading down that path. And I suspect, Pat, that uh, you will help bring us together here in the state of Rhode Island. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the things uh, that matter in relationship to the Secretary of State's office. And I know that um, we have some uh, recent happenings that you most likely want to talk about. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Let Rhode Island Vote Act. And uh, as uh, you very well know, and hopefully our viewers will know, that uh, 
last week it passed uh, the Rhode Island General Assembly overwhelmingly and is now before the uh, Rhode Island Senate. Uh, and it is expected to pass the Rhode Island Senate as well. Uh, Pat, what is your assessment of this law uh, potentially being passed? Is it good, bad, or neutral? Well, the way they had, the way the bill is presented, there's some good things in there, like braille reading for uh, people who might not be able to see a ballot. Uh, there's some early voting, uh, 20 days early to vote. Uh, so there's, there's a few good things, but what they did was they did this caveat where they, they put in some bad things or maybe things they should have protected which uh, are not in the bill. For instance, um, it's called ballot harvesting. For folks who don't understand that, it, it basically uh, under the Board of Elections, from what I was told, uh, there was a maximum of 50 ballots an individual could take back to the BOE, the Board of Elections. Um, as we, we were talking, there was a case, I think in 2017, in which there was a, a candidate who paid someone 4,000 bucks to go out and get 230 mail ballots in which he had to notarize. And that really was uh, illegal, um, but it was enforced, the 50 so-called individual who brought uh, maximum. So with that said, that now it's going to be with the, the Vote Rhode Island Act, the, they removed that uh, restriction, and now it's as many as you can bring in per individual. Um, and uh, that creates a problem because now once uh, also the voter, the voter um, protections have been removed, as in witness, witnesses on the statement there, and also on the ballot you required a notary to notarize who, if you did sign your ballot to go into the mail. Those have been removed, so it's really open now to potential fraud. Um, now, as you know, uh, three Rhode Islanders were caught um, with, uh, charged with mail ballot fraud. Mm -hmm. um, the three Rhode Islanders voted in two different uh, elections uh, at the same time. Uh, one gentleman was in Florida, uh, he voted in Florida, but he's a Rhode Islander. He voted in the Rhode Island 2020 election, and, th and two other gentlemen uh, from Portsmouth and Narragansett, <coughs> excuse me, voted. But what's interesting, in, what's interesting about it is that it was the Board of Elections from Florida that called the Rhode Island Board of Elections to tell them, hey, through our software, and to, uh, I think, another nonprofit, uh, 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 basically, a, I guess you could call it an election uh, watchdog group, uh, call them that they had information that uh, they had three people who voted twice, and that's, that's mail ballot fraud. They used so, the mail well, what ballot they were, system. What they were saying is that they believe that um, these three gentlemen had voted twice once in the state of Florida and once in the state of Rhode Island. And they're residents of Rhode Island. And they're residents of Rhode Island. So what happened was um, they contacted, uh, you know, the uh, attorney general's office and he looked at it and they, they charged the three with criminal charges. They're pending now, actually. And it carries a 10 year, if I remember, it's a 10 year, f um, uh, maximum sentence in a f maximum $5,000 fine. So they are severe if you get caught cheating. So what, what troubled us, myself and other people, was that why wasn't the, the, so, uh, the uh, Secretary of State's office the one who made the contact? Why did it take Florida and their Board of Elections to contact us? Somebody wasn't watching. And it's been brought to my attention uh, that there were 71 cases of potential voter fraud in the 2020 election. The Board of Elections, um, for whatever reason, um, I guess uh, did not uh, look into or maybe decided not to press further with the AG on the other uh, 68 maybe, if it's minus the 71. So you had that many out there pending. And uh, so they only went with three, but we, the bottom line is uh, that we did have mail ballot fraud 
They did it online also, which is a very potentially software issue. When you're, you know, registering to vote online is problematic, you know, and that's why that happened. So, well, Frank, let me uh, uh, let me <laughs> ask you something that just came to my mind. Uh, very often, you hear in um, situations where uh, there may be some fraudulent voting going on, um, and uh, let's let's assume for the moment that that's true. We often hear the expression, "Well, it didn't change the results." of the election. So it doesn't count. So I'm asking you, Pat Cordelessa, does it count or does it not count? Well, you're going to look, I take it as case by case study. If you have one mail bat ballot uh, person who's, who's uh, you know, committed fraud, that cancels out someone like yourself or someone that's honorable, that's voting. And that one bad vote, um, you know, nullifies a good vote if you think about it that way. Also, um, you gotta have confidence, integrity with the system. So even if there's one, two, or three, or four, or five, you still have to keep an eye on it and you know, make sure it doesn't expand into multiple people of, of, of cheating with the election. So it could be small, or it could be one, it could be a thousand. And um, I just believe that this Secretary of State's office is not looking. And I could tell you that there were people that registered to vote at the Secretary of State's office with no IDs. Now, that's a whole other issue, the registration system. Gym cards or gym paperwork or doctor's notes or credit card. Um, and it's so, they're, they're watered down so much. I'm surprised they have anything. So, so uh, Pat, given... And once they're on the voting roll, it's pretty hard to yeah. get them to strike them off. So, so given those concerns that you have about some of the changes that have been made or some of the things that are being done that, in your opinion, they're not adequately monitored and dealt with, what would you do as Secretary of State to fix it? Well, I think it has to come from the top. As Secretary of State, I would implement that, that uh, the clerks enforce those, those laws. And they'd be a little more, I had, like I told uh, a few years back, the interpretation has to be a little more stringent, a little more tougher to make sure everybody is voting fairly. Registration is very important because, you know, if, if you go in and you get on the voter roll, um, and you, if you get a, um, a Rhode Island state uh, photo ID, then you can go and vote in person. The question becomes when the registration process, I think right now is somewhat, needs to be tightened up a bit. I, you gotta remove some of those re requirements. I think the, you know, a credit card, I mean, somebody's credit card, you can get on the voter roll. Think about that. Mm -hmm. You see someone's credit card and you go down and they-, they So if that's going on, what was the big fuss all about with the voter ID law that was passed a number of years ago? Well, they wanted to restrict it. They wanted to remove that also. But I think they found out that they found a better way of getting around that by what I just explained about voter registration. See, the mail ballots without photo ID requirement bypasses the, the voter ID law, photo ID. Well, would you, uh, you, you had mentioned that they had removed the requirement to have a witness of signing and uh, a notary to affirm that the person who signed is indeed that person. So would you reinstitute those uh, parts of the law? Well, I think there's something we can really look into and we would try to, um, if the General Assembly would have, once it goes in this, a Secretary of State could submit legislation for the General Assembly to look at. Um, sure, we would probably try to put it back in, but once it's removed, probably within the next 10 days, and once the governor signs it in, into law, it's gonna be pretty hard to get that back. I think, uh, in the, in, as far as the Secretary of State's position goes, I think they have enough um, authority to maybe get some of the restrictions, uh, put some 
changing of the requirements to register the vote, I think that's where the problem stems from right there. Because once they're on the voting rolls, you know, you're really going to have a hard time getting them off unless they don't vote for five years. Because that was another idea I had, five or six years, if you don't use your voting rights, it goes into some type of hibernation status, which is good. And ultimately, they get removed off the voter roll. And that's why we have 785,000 registered voters in Rhode Island when you only have a population of a million point 25 or something like that. So it doesn't really add up. The, the balancing there doesn't seem to so be you, going you, too well. Uh, I, 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 th I think I hear you saying that um, the uh, uh, voter registration, uh, that is the number of people who are registered to vote, is not an accurate representation of the number of voters that we have in this state? Well, I think that's how people are getting on when maybe they're not really supposed to be getting on because they're not showing the appropriate identification. Again, a credit card or, or, or a gym card with no photo ID to get on the voting roll, you know, I think that's kind of weak. And I mean, if, you know, we're, you know, we just can't go around and I was told, you know, they're registering people everywhere, you know, aggressively. Um, that maybe not even uh, American citizens, they shouldn't even be voting in, in, in our, in our uh, issues there. Getting back to the census issue, we just found out there was 55,000 alleged phantom Rhode Islanders. Um, overcount, they call it. The overcount, the election, <laughs> the, um, yes, the overcount for the, um, the, the Senate seat there, or the yeah, congressional the seat. The census. Uh, the census uh, seat. Uh, taking that uh, took place uh, most recently. Um, a, a committee that was, com that, that was, you know, basically put together with um, some Democrats who are running for state offices now. So, you know, basically these 55,000 um, alleged individuals from Rhode Island residents don't exist. And, you know, they knew they had to get 19,000, they were short 19,000 individuals or uh, residents, we'll call them. Mm -hmm. And they worked so good at it, they got 55,000. They made it look really foolish <laughs> <laughs> until the U.S. Census did an audit. And that's when they found out, hey, what happened in Rhode Island here? So Florida, and I think, uh, I think Texas, who did not gain a seat because of Rhode Island keeping their seat, are pretty upset. Well, uh, uh, Pat Cordelessa, let me ask you this. Uh, these, the Department of Census, or the Census Bureau, um, acknowledged that there was a 55,000 people overcount. So, what was done about it? Well, that's a good question. Um, supposedly, uh, there's a there was a, a state years ago that appealed that, and the Supreme Court allegedly said, well, unfortunately, we won't want to get into this thing. Leave, it, leave the numbers as they are, and in 10 years, do a recount then and you know, make it work itself out. So honestly, um, the powers of to be knew that there would be no repercussions so technically, just make sure you get the overcount, get the seat protected, and then when it comes down to if they do find out, nothing's going to happen. So unless there's, there's no consequence for an overcount. Unless, unless they can prove willful criminal behavior, activity, fraud, and you know that's a... That's a level that you have to get yeah, to. It's, high. it's in, a higher level, in, sure. In, you know, the bar is a little higher than just, I didn't know what we were doing, we overcounted, we, you know, you, you, you can see, um, and I gotta say, John Marion from Common Cause has really let me down, because you know, that was um, an organization that was supposed to be like a government watchdog group, and now it's became more like a, a democratic uh, Bach and hound dog uh, support supporter. You well, know, it's really, what was it that John Marion? Well, he had was to one say. of the. He was one of the. He he basically was a spokesman uh, for the uh, Rhode Island Census 
committee. He was a member. And, you know, he basically said somewhat strangely that, oh, we might have overcounted some people. And he kind of like made a few comments like, well, that's the way it is. We won. So technically it was like, we can win at all costs. It doesn't matter if we cheat. Then, of course, uh, another fellow on the committee says, well, you know, with Trump, we had to, you know, really work at this and, you know, we'll, we'll get around him one way or the other. <laughs> hmm. So, you know, and... and that's, uh, that's very interesting commentary. Yes, it Pat. is. That, um, well, um, that, let me ask you this question. Um, the Secretary of State is an elected office. Um, do you believe that it's prudent to have someone who's going to be elected to that office to be playing a critical role in elections? Should that uh, responsibility, responsibility be placed elsewhere? Well, if you're talking about what's happening this year, when you have the Secretary of State running for governor, who's overseeing the elections, whose name is on the primary ballots. Um, I think there should be some type of law that says any candidate that wants to do certain, you know, jump into different, uh, you know, uh, public offices should resign or step aside. Because that's a conflict of interest if you think about it. And it's actually given um, one candidate a little leverage over the others. Um, because the board, of, the board of Elections really dic is dictated by the Secretary of State's office. So she basically calls the shots. And of course, you know, we haven't got into the multi-million dollar mach voting machine that handles mail ballots. So, you know, quickly, when the well, mail... Well, yes, let's, let's talk about that. That's there's, an interesting... There's a, <laughs> there's a particular machine that, uh, that reads just mail-in ballots... From what I was told, the machine is a very special machine that when the mail ballots come in, the, the, uh, uh, the seal envelope goes through the machine. It actually opens the envelope, the, the, the big envelope up, removes the ballot. Dis uh, they discard the, the, uh, out the, uh, the uh, envelope. Mm -hmm. I think they take a photograph, if I'm not mistaken, this year of the signature in the mail ballot application. However, the software that's supposed to read the signature for a match is not being used. And they're using election workers to do a comparis comparison study on that. Now you think about that for a second. Two years ago, we had close to 180,000 mail ballots. Mm -hmm. Are you people standing there looking at these things? Like, you know, like, are they, are they got hand experts? Are they just average guys taking, from what I was told, they took a 15 to a half hour um, class on the internet on hand signature match, you know? So my opinion is that why have that multi-million dollar machine not being used to its fullest extent? The, that machine basically can't cheat unless the software is, is, is tinkered with. And I brought that up at my, my testimony in front of the Board of uh, the Election uh, State Committee there. Um, and I was a little taken back that, why is that, why, it, well, number one, who made that decision to go with, you know, the, the election workers, not use the software on the machine to compare the signatures? It's a question that still hasn't been answered. Yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting question that probably, in my opinion, needs to be answered. Exactly. Uh, Pat, we have less than five minutes remaining, okay. so um, I want to bring to your attention uh, something else that I think you might be quite aware of. It's my understanding that uh, an East Providence uh, election official resigned uh, when this, as a result of this particular law, Let Rhode Island Vote Act, passed the House of Representatives. Do you know anything about that? Yes, I did read that, and uh, he, uh, he was there for several years, and uh, he couldn't uh, consciously 
stay on the, um, the Board of Elections in East Providence, uh, knowing that uh, he would have to try to enforce these, these new laws. And he said, I couldn't do it. He yeah. goes, I think it's, it's ripe for fraud. So the East Providence uh, Board of Canvassers, I think he was with, he resigned. So uh, congratulations to him, somebody with moral standards, finally, you know, that he put his foot down. He said, I'm not going to go down there and play this game with this potential new law coming out. You know, that's very interesting because um, on May 23rd, that's today. Yes. <laughs> uh, the Providence Journal published an article entitled, Mail Ballots, a Win for Voting Rights or Potential for Abuse. That was the, the, the title of the editorial. And the opening paragraph was this. A long overdue reform to absentee voting laws, that was a question mark, or an open door to voter abuse and fraud, question mark. Rhode Island's mail ballot laws has a long and colorful history. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Catherine Gregg did, did a great job on that story. I, I give her condos, kudos, whatever, I mean, uh, I was very impressed with that story, and she's trying to bring out honorably the different aspects of that potential law. Again, why wouldn't they put restrictions in, in, in the law to keep potential ballot harvesters to come out? You know, we gotta, we, it's going to really change the aspects of, 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 of voting now, uh, historically in Rhode Island and then down the road, like I said. You're probably going to have no more than 15% of voting in person on Election Day uh, within the next five years. And, uh, so you, know, you, you agree that uh, uh, her, her description <laughs> oh, yeah. at, at the very beginning is uh, a, a rather interesting and probably valid uh, description. One um, more thing, John, quickly. Sure. As you know, when you were in, you're also, when you ran for Secretary of State in 2014, candidates had an opportunity post-election regarding mail ballot signatures that reflected their campaign. In my case, I had 4,000, 4,500 mail ballots, and I requested to go in post-election just to make sure the signatures matched the people uh, that voted with or against me. Yep. And I was denied that opportunity. Ooh. They've waived that now. We don't have candidates, Democratic, Republican, independents don't have that option anymore. Oh. So we're stuck, whatever the numbers come in at the end of the election, that night, or day, the next day, and we have no recourse. We have to take their word for it. So again, you know, I'd rather have the software feel some confidence sure. in the signatures than having election workers. Well, Pat, and with less than a minute to go, okay. tell the voters what you want to tell them in this last remaining minute. Ladies and gentlemen, voters, the electorate of Rhode Island, um, I would like to have your support. I think it's time to clean up the Secretary of State's office and the Board of Elections to enforce the, the laws of, of uh, Rhode Island and make sure they're fair and equitable for everybody, but also have protections there to remove the opportunity of fraud and uh, malcontents and um, overzealous candidates to take advantage of the system. Thank you very much, Pat Cordelesas candidate for Secretary of State. You've been watching State of the State and please join us again next time for the next edition of State of the State.